In the early hours of April 17, 1961, Private James O'Brien found himself aboard a landing craft, skimming across the dark waters towards the beach. The air was thick with tension, each soldier lost in their thoughts. The only sound was the low hum of the boat's engine. James clutches his rifle tightly to his chest, his mind filled with briefings and training they had undergone. They were told that it would be a swift operation, a decisive blow to Castro's regime, but as the Cuban shoreline loomed in the darkness, a sense of unease crept into James's heart, where the first hint of dawn was just beginning to lighten the sky where chaos erupted. Bright tracers cut through the darkness and the deafening roar of gunfire filled the air. The landing craft lurched violently as a shell exploded nearby, throwing James over and onto the deck. Scrambling to his feet, he followed his comrades charging onto the beach. The sand under his boots gave way to the jungle as they pushed further inland. But the resistance was fierce. They were met with a wall of fire. The Cuban forces far more prepared than they had been led to believe. Days now turned into a blur of gunfire, heat and fear. The promised support never came and within each passing hour their situation grew more desperate. They were outnumbered, outgunned and running out of supplies. Finally, after three days of intense fighting, the order came through to surrender. James and his comrades were rounded up and a look of disbelief was across their faces. They had been assured of victory, yet here they were, prisoners in a foreign land. So you might be thinking, what happened? Huh? How did the Cubans, who were supposed to be a ragtag bunch of hastily put together local militia, manage to overwhelm the well-trained and special forces that the US had put together for it? Well, our story begins early in the 1960s, in the heart of the Cold War. The newly elected president, John F. Kennedy, is faced with a major decision. Following the Cuban Revolution in 1959, Fidel Castro rose to power, overthrowing the Batista regime and establishing a communist government in Cuba. But Castro's alignment with the Soviet Union raised alarm bells back in Washington. The United States feared that the spread of communism in its own backyard and the potential threat to its interests in the Western Hemisphere. So Kennedy and his advisors are planning Operation Zapata a covert operation to overthrow Fidel Castro's regime in Cuba. And in April 1961, under the newly inaugurated President John F. Kennedy, the CIA launched a covert operation known as the Bay of Pigs Invasion. The plan was to support Cuban exiles in a mission to invade the island and spark a popular uprising against Castro's communist government. And they were told the invasion was supposed to be a swift and decisive blow to Castro's regime. But the operation faced numerous setbacks straight from the start. Because meanwhile, in the background, in the jungles of Guatemala, Cuban exiles are actually being trained by the CIA. They are chosen ones, the Freedom Fighters, the Brigade 2506. The Cuban exiles lacked proper training and support, and the invasion force was poorly coordinated. Additionally, Cuban forces were tipped off about the invasion, began bulking up defenses, and were able to swiftly counterattack. Thousands of men were put under emergency orders as they had been during past invasion scares. The waterfront in Havana and along other parts of the coast bristled with gun emplacements as the Cuban regime waited to see what their bosses in the Kremlin were to do. Cuba became the focus of world attention. Here centered the most critical threat of global war since the surrender of Germany 17 years ago. But despite these risks, Kennedy still gives the go-ahead. Operation Zapata is set into motion, and on April 17th, 1961, the invasion began as Cuban exiles landed at the Bay of Pigs. But what was intended to be a liberation quickly turned into a disaster. The brigade's two supply ships and its communications ship are sunk. Within a few minutes, the men on the beach have lost their air cover and their supplies. Now, Castro can bring up his tanks without fear of air attack. And he can bring up thousands of his milicianos. By afternoon, Castro is pressing the brigade hard. How are they to survive? Where are they to get help? Some expect it to come from the underground. There is no uprising, there is no sabotage, there is no help from the underground for the brigade. 
The exiles found themselves outnumbered and outgunned, but things didn't go as planned. The resistance was stronger than expected and the support they were promised actually never came. Their hopes were dashed as their mission crumbled before their very eyes. After three days of intense fighting, they were actually forced to surrender, causing the Bay of Pigs invasion to actually be a disaster. And the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs invasion was devastating. Over 1200 exiles were captured and more than 100 were killed in action. The failure of the operation was a humiliating blow to the United States and a propaganda victory for Castro's regime. Back in the United States, the failed invasion had serious repercussions. President Kennedy faced severe criticism. But the Bay of Pigs wasn't just a military failure. It also set the stage for one of the most tense moments in the history, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I'm sure most people have heard of, but if you've not, I should be covering it in the next few videos. But anyways, in response to the Bay of Pigs debacle, Castro sought protection from the Soviet Union, leading to the installation of nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba. The world held its breath as the two superpowers teetered on the brink of a nuclear war. And so, the Bay of Pigs invasion serves as a stark reminder of the complexities of international politics and the unpredictability of military interventions. Stay tuned for one of our next videos where we delve into the Cuban Missile Crisis, but until then, I'll see you next time. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We choose to go to the moon, not because they are easy, but because they are hard.